Welcome to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, you Road to Growth listeners. Today I have uh, Sarah Townsing. She is a best-selling author and speaker. Used to be a freelance writer, now has put out a book that really helps out with mindset. I mean, especially for, for any kind of entrepreneur out there. If you're an entrepreneur and you've started a business or at least thought about a business, you've probably had, I guess, these negative ideas in your head. And this is where uh, really Sarah's come in. Thank you, Sarah, for being here. Oh, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we were talking we were talking about before we got on camera about kind of some of just the ideas. I mean, one of the the key ones I think that that popped up is imposter syndrome. I was talking to uh, um, uh, another gentleman on Friday. He owns a um, a fitness company, Alloy Fitness, and he sold his product over to two hundred and fifty other gyms. and And he was bringing up the idea of imposter syndrome. It's something he still works on. And I think it's most people yeah. I've had on this podcast that imposter syndrome. Uh, it doesn't matter how big you get. I mean, I think a lot of people still have that. Yeah, it's it's it's, in, it's interesting because I think there's a perception with a lot of people that it's something that predominantly affects women, and that's not the case at all. And it really can impact everybody from the intern to, to the CEO. So it doesn't matter how long you've been doing what you're doing, how much confidence you have. It's just something that we all feel from time to time. I think. I always find it so. I mean. It, almost kind of put back a little bit when I see people that that exude so much confidence and you're like oh my gosh where does that come from oh my god yeah. it's so impressive right there like yeah yeah um, yeah and you see people like that but then you realize that um so there's uh Tom Hanks Lady Gaga Serena Williams Kylie Minogue all these high profile people have all admitted to suffering from imposter syndrome so I figure that if it's good enough for them it's good enough for the rest of us right yeah, for sure. What now? <clears throat> walk us through. I mean, your journey. So, at a young age, were you always writing? Were you out, out and about? I mean, who was a young Sarah? Um. Yeah. So, kind of going way back. Yeah, I was always a little bit of a nerd at school. I've always loved writing. I've always been quite a detail freak. So, I really enjoy making copy really accurate as well as clear and concise and convertible and that sort of thing um but yeah i i wouldn't say that i knew that i wanted to be a writer my first job was straight from college uh, i actually joined a financial services company and i did uh, mortgage admin and pensions admin and i did that for a few years and i sort of fell into marketing when the uh, the marketing department for the company i was working for when they actually relocated up from london here in the uk and yeah i kind of did that for about three years and then joined the company that was publishing our customer magazine and worked there for three years and then I became pregnant and to be honest being a freelancer being an entrepreneur being self-employed none of those things had ever appealed to me I didn't really know anything about how to be self-employed I just figured that I would be okay at it so when I became pregnant I was working in a different city to the city where I live and I just thought I was married at the time and my husband at the time had a reasonably steady income and we were like, OK, reasonably comfortably off. We could cover the mortgage every month and the bills. And I just thought, yeah, you know, I, I'm a good editor and proofreader, as I was focusing on doing at the time. And I just thought I'm naturally quite an organized, disciplined, self-motivated, driven sort of person. So I thought, OK, this will be a breeze. You know, I can be self-employed and that'll be great. Um, and to be honest, I found a lot of challenges that I really had not been anticipating. And I realized years into freelance life that actually I wasn't alone and that really everybody who first goes self-employed there's a lot of the business end of self-employment that we don't necessarily anticipate. There's a lot of things that we don't necessarily know how to do. And it does come with these challenges from the unpredictable workload to the joys of working alone, the isolation, the imposter syndrome, the self-doubt, fear of failure, all these things. 
And um, yeah, I guess at the start of last year before COVID really hit, I just decided to write this book because I wanted to share my experiences so that other people could become successful in self-employment a lot quicker and with a lot fewer mistakes than I made. So um, yeah, I wrote this this book and the rest okay. is history. Perfect. So let's rewind. There's a lot of things to, to unwrap <laughs> in, in, in that right there. All right. So you went back, you were behind the scenes in, in a lending company, correct? Right after college? I was working for a financial services company that did, yeah, lending mortgages. That's okay. So that was uh, numbers and things like that. Was it interacting any kind of creativity anything like that? no it was more it was more just kind of day-to-day -day admin so policy admin like making sure people's payment methods didn't fail and making sure their addresses were up to date and this kind of thing it was really fairly basic admin sort of job with not really any creativity involved at all and i feel as if that i kind of repressed the creative side of me a bit at the time I've not really thought back because it was a very long time ago I've not really thought back to that time to think whether I was actually doing anything on the side that would have kept the creativity going but yeah I, I always lo love to write even though I wasn't always doing it in my career now the opportunity for the marketing in that in that company mm. came about how did that come about was it simply just conversation was it someone hey you know, Sarah, you seem like a creative person. I mean, what what happened to transition over there to marketing? No, so um, the company that I was working in was based in a town um, here in the UK called Cheltenham, and they had their marketing department all based in London. And the marketing department relocated up. So a lot of people didn't want to leave London. So that left them with quite a few vacancies. And it just meant that I heard about them relocating and I'd always fancied the idea of marketing because to me marketing felt like a creative job so I just assumed that I'd be able to get a job in marketing and I think kind of that backing myself and having that confidence paid off because I applied for the job I got the job and then I started the process of being trained in marketing so I've maybe gone through things a little bit differently to other people in that I've done marketing on the client side and then I've gone to the agency side and then I've done freelance. So I've done the the full works really. Do you, I know, again, I know it was a long time ago. What was, when you got the job now in your, I guess your ability to be creative did that remind you anything that changed anything in you Did that open anything up? Maybe that you look back and that opened something that kind of gave you the, the stepping stone to actually opening your own business. I mean, do you remember who you were at that time? Well, I started work in 1988, so it is quite hard to think yeah. back that long ago, but I, I used to get involved in things like, photo shoots we'd have we'd be putting together product brochures and we'd have these photo shoots and I'd go and kind of do a bit of art direction because I always had that creativity in me so for me being able to write product copy even though it might have been about an investment product like a bond or a savings plan or something like this or about pensions um it was all very financial very dry stuff and um even though I was doing that I loved it. I loved having the opportunity to work with words because that was the passion that had always existed within me. Now you're in the marketing and then you kind of transition into freelance writing. Now the freelance writing, is it, I mean, I, I kind of have a brief idea of it, right? Where you get opportunities or you get to put a piece together and you can sell that piece to different companies. I mean, what did that look like as a freelance writer when you transitioned from that marketing company, that steady paycheck? Well, it was it, it was very different. As you say, the steady paycheck was no longer. So, um, yeah, it, it was all very much more tentative. Like there was a lot of insecurity involved in the fact that I was only as good as my last job, which when you're in an employed role, you don't so much get that feeling. So uh, being having to put myself out there and find clients for myself and find work. It wasn't that I was doing speculative writing. I would find a company locally that I wanted to work with and then perhaps send them a cold approach letter 
in those days because this was pretty much before the internet. So I had letterheaded paper when I first started my business and used to send um, actual mail to, to companies. And as you'd probably expect, a lot of letters fell on deaf ears. I didn't get responses from a lot of businesses, but I did get a few picked up and liked the sound of working with me. So met with me face to face because I was pretty much only focusing on local businesses at the time. And yeah, I made some really good connections back then really early on. And I found that once I'd got a good reputation for working for a few businesses, it just became a lot easier to approach other businesses and say, look, I'm already doing work for this company take you know take a chance and and is there anything that I can write for you or would you would you need any help with your marketing like knocking your documents into shape for example because I used to work with local authorities so councils and the type of stuff that they write about it would often be very dry and very boring and I would come along and inject a bit of sparkle and a bit of clarity into what they were trying to say, because I'm more very much about human to human communication. That's what it's all about for me. It's not we are an organization and we are addressing a mass of people. It's one person talking to one person. So, um, yeah, very much focused on plain English and that sort of thing. And I quite quickly built up a reputation as being good at my job. And then that made life easier. Now, it sounds like that you leveraged a lot. Like once you got your foot in the door for one company or one entity, right, you you'd go to another place and go, hey, you know what? Here is the person that I used in the past. Because you were changing, it sounds like, at least the way the, the words were written and how uh, information was given to, I guess, the, the, the masses. Precisely. And, and usually people don't like change. Mm. So did you get the people that you worked with in the past to call those people up? Did you have basically letters of recommendation? I mean, what was that looking like to make them believe in, in what you're doing? I think it comes down to the things in um, Robert Cialdini's book, The uh, the Principles of Persuasion. And I didn't realize that at the time because I hadn't, I didn't read it for years and years. Um, but I was kind of instinctively using those techniques to grow my business and to become more established as a freelance copywriter. So I would always ask people to recommend me. So if they had a colleague in a different business or a different organization who they thought would benefit from my skills and my services, I would say, please do tell your colleagues and, um, you know, pass on my details. I would always ask people for testimonials. And when I got my very first website back in 2002, one of the first things that I put on my website was the testimonials from the clients that I'd already worked with. Hmm. So, okay. So you, you were a first mover to even the website. So once the yeah. website, okay. early on, yeah, really early on. And I think I was the first copywriter in the UK or certainly one of the first to have my own little promotional video. So I've always been quite an early adopter. I like to try new things. They don't always work, do they? But you've got to try before you know whether it's going to work for you or not. So it's worth putting yourself out there and taking those risks. And um, that's how we all grow as individuals and as business owners. Now, as a, through that process as a freelance writer, over time, did you bring people onto your team? Did you bring on admin? Did you bring on other writers? What did that look like as you grew your business? Um, so for me, I always knew that I wanted to run my business as a company of one. I just want to stay. I want to keep it simple. So the way that I, I guess, developed the business over the years was that obviously at the time when I first started, I was charging an hourly rate. So there was always a ceiling on my potential income. I could only earn as much as the hours that I could put into the day. And then of course, what we quite often overlook when we first become freelance or self-employed or an entrepreneur is the fact that you don't actually do paid work every hour that you're working because there are so many other tasks that you have to do. You have to find the clients to begin with. So you're marketing your business, you're doing the sales process, you're doing uh, proposals, invoicing, admin, chasing payments, um, fixing your own computer, 
doing your social media management, all these things that we have to do for our own businesses. So one really great way of scaling up is to free yourself up more hours that are billable by getting on board a team of cheerleaders. So in my case, I've just used other freelancers. I like the fact that I can support the freelance community by giving work to another freelancer. I really like the fact that I'm using all these people who are experts in the fields that I'm not expert in. So I always recommend to people to identify, think of a typical week, if there is such a thing as a typical week when you're self-employed, but think of the tasks that you do on a regular basis that A, you don't enjoy, B, that don't make you money, and C, that you know you're not good at. Because those are the things that they, because you're not good at them and you don't enjoy them, they take you longer. And then by the end of the week, you might end up feeling pretty rubbish about yourself because you know that you've been spending a lot of hours this week doing these things that you really don't enjoy. They're not the thing that sparks the fire in you. They're not the reason that gets you out of bed in the mornings. So if you can find trusted colleagues who you can outsource those things to, it frees you up so much more time to focus on billable work and to do the work that you love. So that's a, I mean, and also since then I've moved away from charging an hourly rate and I now use a value-based charging model, which again, but boosts my um, earnings potential massively. That understanding of bringing on other people and leveraging other people for the, not the content, but the, the, the back stuff, stuff, the nitty gritty stuff, those kind of things, yeah. right? It, it can be a little bit daunting for, I think, for a lot of people, right? Yeah. When you bring on your first I mean, employee, I guess. Yeah. For you, do you remember when you brought on or had the idea of bringing someone on? Um, do you remember who you were at that point? What were you going through your mindset of doing that? Yeah, I do, actually, because I, I share the story in the book. Um, what happened was I... I'd, I'd actually been running my business for about 15 years and I hadn't outsourced. I, I I just couldn't get my head around the concept of paying someone else the money that I was working so hard to earn. So for me, the concept of self-employment was you want to make money for yourself. And I just couldn't seem to reconcile it for so many years. And then I realized that my it, it was a period of time where my house needed a lot of decorating doing to it. And I actually quite like painting walls. I'm not very good at it, but I enjoy doing it. So I'd always done my own decorating and just got on with it. And then I thought, okay, well, I'm really busy with work. I really don't have time to do the painting, but I wanna get the work done. And then I realized that actually, if I could outsource the task of painting my house, I would get it done quicker I'd get it done better than if I was doing it myself. And I would be paying the decorator less than I could earn by doing, so say it was gonna cost, say it was gonna take the decorator 20 hours. I could earn a heck of a lot more in 20 hours if I was doing billable work than it was gonna cost me to outsource to the decorator. Yeah. So as soon as I would grasped that idea and I'd done that and I'd had this fantastic result in my, my home looked amazing. And in the meantime, I'd been able to continue with my work and it was uninterrupted. And then I thought, well, it just feels like a no brainer. I can't believe I haven't done this before. So I'm not going to lie. It's not always a straightforward finding the right person. Sometimes it can take time to get the person that's the right fit and that works in a way that you want them to work. And also I am naturally quite a control freaky kind of person. So for me, it was difficult to let go. And not because I thought that my way was the best way, but because my way was my way. And I just like I like to be in control. That's all I can say. I like to know exactly what's going on. So I had to do it very, very gradually. And yeah, since then, I, I've just been talking to um, virtual assistants here in the UK um, quite a bit over the past week because I'm in a situation where the person I was working with has moved on and is now doing something completely different. So now I have to find someone again who is the right fit with my business, who understands where I want my business to go, who understands my goals and my values and is a good match with those things. So 
yeah, it can take time. It is a big trust issue, I think, to begin with. But I feel that once you're in the mindset of going, wow, you know, the amount of time, the amount of hours and the headspace that it frees up when you find this kind of team of cheerleaders that are all working on behalf of your business, but without the hassle of the tax implications of being employed and and this sort of thing, it's really empowering. It's a really good place to be. So are they, uh, that last part right there, are they on your payroll or are they per job? No, they're all, um, I don't have anybody on my payroll because I just wanted to keep the admin side of things simple. So I pay them um, a certain number of hours a month or just on an ad hoc basis as and when I need them. I use uh, an IT support company to support my Apple Macs and they just charge me like, 30 bucks a month um to to do all the um to do all the support on my computer which is amazing they just if something goes wrong with my computer they just remote in and so it so each different supplier works on a different like pay kind of basis so basically i mean because i think for i think for a lot of people a lot of entrepreneurs right when you bring on um uh, an employee that's on your payroll right you're like oh my gosh i have to make sure i have enough business to support yeah. them for the next yeah, yeah. You know, month to six months, whatever it might be for, for how you did it. It's okay. Well, if it doesn't work out next month, I can reassess mm. and then figure it out next month. So that, that probably got, give you a lot of peace of mind when you were transitioning. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, now you talked about it briefly that I think at the time when you transitioned, um, at the beginning of the podcast, transition to freelance you were married at the time correct yes yeah and and then is that still the same are you married still or no I so I got divorced like 14 years ago so I've been a single parent for a lot of my self-employed journey and um yeah so I've been co-parenting with my ex-husband and yeah funnily enough actually when I first hired an accountant I actually hired my ex-husband even though we'd been divorced about eight years um and, and that's a whole other story for another day but yeah um it's just been me with my kids and to begin with that that felt like an awful lot of pressure because not to have that one regular income coming into the household but by the time we got divorced I was established as a freelancer and I had a regular income coming in I had enough work like regular bread and butter work um we would say here in the UK um that would cover the bills it would cover the mortgage and to begin with that felt like the financial pressure of needing to provide security and safety for my kids felt like the driving force behind my business for a really long time. I've had, I mean, more recently, I think, more entrepreneurs that talk about their journey into entrepreneurship and building their business. And one of the things that I've, I've heard more frequently, like, maybe it's just kind of more open to it and hearing it is that transition from corporate world, that steady paycheck into mm-hmm. entrepreneurship. Usually that re- the relationship that they're currently in, it plays a effect right there. And, and now when they tell me they look back on it, there's things they would have done differently. Is there anything that you might've done differently or yeah. if someone's listening right now, if they're in a relationship where they're looking to transition, I mean. Yeah, that is a really big question. And it's funny because It wasn't until I sat and wrote the book that I thought, "Mm, yeah, I guess I could could certainly see that there were warning signs that I couldn't see at the time. And a lot of it came down to the fact that I didn't have boundaries. So I started my self-employed career when I became pregnant with my daughter. So I was in this position where I had two things that I knew nothing about. I was trying to be a mom on the one hand, I didn't know anything about being a parent. I was trying to run a business. And both of those things were new, and they both happened at the same time. So I was under an awful lot of pressure. And 
I didn't realize at the time that it was okay to say no to the wrong work. It was okay to say no if I was too busy. It was okay to say no if a client made me feel uncomfortable and I didn't want to work with that person. So I would just say yes to everything, like every piece of work that came my way. I'd say yes whether I had time to do it or not. I'd say yes whether I had the skills to do it or not. And then that just put me under so much pressure. I also found it really hard to take time off. So even when I was taking, like even when say the weekend came, I'd always be thinking, oh my gosh, maybe I should be checking my emails. Maybe I should be um, like finishing off this piece of work, even though the whole driver behind me becoming self-employed was so that I could work around having a family. So yeah, it, it, it was an awful lot of pressure for the early years of parenting and the early years of running a business. And yeah, perhaps looking back, I should have recognized that sooner i i think and this is for me because I, I i felt that before i don't have any kids but i know the idea of always saying yes always picking your phone yeah. it, i think it's that scarcity mindset that you're not going to get that other job you need it right now yeah. Yeah. once you're able to switch over to abundance right you're like i got another another job and then start saying no it's just, it's one of the most empowering things i think any absolutely other and they and i genuinely think this is why I had the idea of writing the book because I don't want other people to go through that. I really don't. It can be so difficult. And I just believe that the um, the secret to a more fulfilling and more fun freelance life is boundaries like learning to say no, having kind of, it's so empowering, it's so important, knowing that you're in charge, remembering that actually you became you became self-employed to begin with because you like the idea of being your own boss. But quite quickly, we find that we end up with multiple clients. And instead of us setting the terms, you know, these are my working hours. I will and will not answer emails during this time. I don't check my emails during the day while I'm doing this. And it's okay to set those boundaries around what we do. And it's not just setting boundaries for our clients, it's also setting boundaries for ourselves. Because as you say, there's just always the temptation to pick up your phone and just check your email. But actually, you know, it's the weekend. I went freelance because I wanted to, at the time, I wanted to work part-time when my daughter was in nursery. And I wanted to be a, a present parent when she wasn't. And yeah, I, I didn't get everything right to begin with. And But at the, at the same time, way back then, I was like a woman in my 20s. I couldn't find the support I needed. Bear in mind that there was very, very little internet back then. And there was certainly no social media. So there were no online communities. There was no Facebook groups, no Slack, no nothing. And I couldn't find the support that I needed that was somebody I could relate to, somebody who spoke to me in a voice that was my own voice, you know, who was reassuring and was there to kind of go, look, you have to take care of your own mental health and well-being because if you don't, no one else is going to do it for you. So when you realize that you need to set those boundaries and you realize it's okay to say no and you're just going to get so much more enjoyment from entrepreneurship it's it's crazy how much of a difference it makes and i i think it's i mean at least and you correct me if i'm wrong i mean it's when you're in that moment of finding business because you don't have the business i mean it's hard to be picky i mean it's hard to be picky right yeah, yeah. how let's say if you were to go back just to your past self that person that was transitioning mm -hmm. from corporate to freelancer is there steps that you would have taken into place because you know you had to make money, yet also trying to protect your time and mm. availability. I mean, there's steps you would have done at that point. Well, yeah, I what you say is absolutely bang on accurate. I think in a way, the ability to say no and having the confidence to turn work down, it's a bit of a luxury. And it's a bit of a luxury that comes along when you have enough regular income and enough regular clients that you know will cover your monthly rent and your bills or whatever your outgoings are you have to have that in place um it takes a very confident freelancer to walk away from a job when they are struggling for income and i wouldn't necessarily recommend it for this reason i would strongly recommend don't start an entrepreneurial business full time until you have a backup of savings. It's really important to have an emergency fund behind you because 
that actually empowers you to take back control when you get those moments of quiet. Because I quite often say the secret to really appreciating the quiet times is to take the fear out of them and see them as a gift. Because when you're working for yourself, it's vital, as we we all know, it's vital to continue to market your business. However busy you get, you have to keep topping up the funnel, don't you? You have to keep those leads coming in. You have to keep putting your message out there. So that's kind of an ongoing thing. And it's something that often slips through the net when you get busy. So if you can start having perhaps a, a, a list, you know, a, a separate to-do list, keep a, um, a piece of paper somewhere or an email, a, a list that has got productive, positive activity that you can focus on when you get those quiet times. And the ideal scenario is that you've got this pot of savings that is going to um, keep you, it's going to keep you ticking over while you're quiet. So that takes off the financial pressure. And when you start focusing on these productive activities, all this positive stuff that you can be doing for your business. So whether that is learning a new skill, um, learning how to uh, write better blog posts for your business, whether you're reading books, you're listening to podcasts, you're doing the self-improvement, the personal development stuff, the growing your business, the marketing your business, you're communicating more, you're getting clearer on who you are, what you do, who you do it for, and what sort of problems you solve for them. So you're continually putting out this positive, productive message, rather than going, oh, oh, I'm feeling panicky because I, I don't have enough work to tide me over. People pick up on that desperation. It's it's true. And though, you know, when you're in that frame of mind, it's the scarcity mindset that you already mentioned. It's very easy to it, it, when you're talking to clients or you're emailing clients and saying, oh, yeah, yep. Yeah, it, it's very easy for that feeling of, oh, I need this work. I need this work that seeps out in your body language, in your words, in your messaging all your communication and when they sense that it's it's almost like a it's almost like a client repellent i don't know if you found this in the in the process of your own business but when you've got that sense of desperation people do pick up on it and it tends to put people off so if you can just take just, the pressure just, off those moments just imagine and, and i use um when i when i coach newer realtors in the business i, I mean i do a little bit of coaching and one of the things that i, I use in the past i don't use it as much now but if if you're a man and you're a single man, right, and you're going to the bar, right, do you, what's going to work better? Is it going to be, please, please, can I buy you a drink? Or is it going to say, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Would you care that is doing? such a good analogy because that's exactly what it is, isn't it? Yeah. People just sense the desperation and then they don't want to work with you anymore. So mm -hmm. it's, it's like the, the whole, you know, the energy um, thing. I really firmly believe that you get more of what you focus on. So when you're focusing on the lack of work, that lack perpetuates. But when you focus on there being enough work for everyone and you focus on that abundant mindset and you're just taking, you're just choosing to take a bit of a break to focus on some of the other things that you need to do for your business upskilling you're improving your knowledge you're growing your network you're nurturing your contacts all those things that we all have to do for our businesses take it as an opportunity see it as a gift and if you can reframe it like that you're golden because as yeah. soon as you do as soon as you get enthused by this other positive activity that you want to be focused on that's when you, you you start thinking, oh, I haven't had time to finish this. And all of a sudden, the, the inquiries start flying back in. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, um, I think when you're just getting started, yes, there are, I think, negatives of not having the business, yet the positive of building a structure, because once you do have the business, you're going to have to find a way to basically support that business. And so Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah, I know it's fantastic. And, and right now, with um, there's like Upwork and other platforms. If you're looking for freelance writing, at least for that, there's probably a lot more opportunities than you had when you're getting going, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I've I've never had to use any of the um of the platforms, so I can't speak with a huge amount of confidence about how great they are. But I do know people who swear by them. Yeah. Now, let's say we're talking in in five years from now, Sarah. 
where where are you going to be where's your your brand going to be what's going to be going on that's that's difficult for me i seem to have a brain that is not wired to 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 do long term plans i really struggle with visualizing things so i'm very much a kind of short term planner so at the moment what is new for me is i'm focusing on um developing my mentoring for uh, freelancers and um and female founders and uh, I'm doing more of that with kind of government schemes here in the UK. I'm also focusing on putting together some ongoing kind of courses and some learning materials that can be a companion course to the book. There's going to be more support and advice and um, yeah, just reassurance through that kind of ongoing learning thing. And I'm also working on a group mentoring program. So there's lots of stuff in the pipeline. And of course, I'm doing all of this on top of my day job, which is the copywriting. So I'm still doing that. It's um, It's been a bit of a challenge this past year to fit everything in. But yeah, I'm on a bit of a mission now to support the small business community. This is just a really, really random thought. I'm, I'll finish off with this one. If what, how has writing changed from when you first started to now? Because now you have SEO and you're trying to get like online clicks. Ha, has writing changed? Is it different a little bit or no? Yeah, massively. So when I first started my career, I was writing entirely for print. And it's a very different scenario. I love the fact that when you're writing for web, you can do the test and measure thing so easily. You can you can write something, you're not sure which paragraph is gonna work best. So yeah, put it out there, try it for a month and then measure it and then go back in and kind of change and try an alternative. But yeah, clarity and brevity are so key now. So um, we, we got, do you know what I miss when Twitter was 140 characters? Because I just think it's such a great discipline to be able to get your message across clearly in so few characters when it doubled for me it lost a little bit of the magic but it's always focusing on your reader and not talking about yourself mm -hmm. so uh if you're writing for your business i think that's probably the the most important tip that i can share focus on what's in it for your client focus on the emotion of how they feel when they work with your business or buy your product or hire your service stop saying we've been established since 1935 and mm -hmm. you know we we're passionate about customer service no one cares you know you've got to show your clients what it's like to work with you don't tell them show them so yeah it's it's changed a lot and, and uh, attention span is probably shorter too right oh, t totally absolutely yeah now if if someone's listening right now and they want more information about being part of one of your groups getting your book following you whatever it might be because i know they're not going to get from right my writing styles following me but if they're going to follow you sarah what's the best way yeah, so the easiest thing by far is to go to survival skills for freelancers.com. So that basically leads to you can buy the book um, from me or from Amazon. You can link to my copywriting website. You can get information about, oh, you can follow me on social media. You can email me. That's survival skills for freelancers.com. And all her information is in the show notes. So if you're listening right now or watching us on, on YouTube, go in the show notes. All Sarah's information is there. Thank you, Sarah, for, for being here. Absolutely. And I, I say it on, on most episodes. It doesn't matter where you are today. It matters where you want to be tomorrow. Take the chance. Learn, adapt, grow. And I mean, one of the, the, the big notes I took away, I think there's so much fear in adding on employees. And that idea of you can add, hire them on per task takes a little bit of that fear away and allows you the ability to grow and expand. And yeah, thank you for that thank little you. epiphany, Sarah. Pleasure. <laughs> it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Please subscribe, please share and follow Sarah. Bye guys.